Welcome to Real Money, Real Experts, a podcast where leading financial counseling and coaching experts share their stories, their challenges, and their advice for helping people manage money in the real world. I'm your host, Rachel DeLeon, Interim Executive Director of the Association for Financial Counseling and Planning Education, or AFCPE. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Mary Bell Carlson, an accredited financial counselor, or AFCE, and the CEO of Carlson Consulting. Every episode, we're taking a deep dive into the topics that personal finance professionals care about, helping clients, building community, and your professional growth. Today, we are excited to welcome a very special guest to the show, the president and CEO of the Jumpstart Coalition for Personal Financial Literacy, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit organization that is committed to financial smarts for students. Laura Levine has devoted her career to helping people of all ages better understand financial services through marketing and outreach, communications, and education. Laura joined Jumpstart in 2004 as the executive director. And under her leadership, Jumpstart has launched the Jumpstart National Educator Conference, Jumpstart Financial Foundations for Educators, Project Groundswell, and Check Your School. Laura has also guided the expansion of Financial Literacy for Youth Month to the broader Financial Literacy Month, which is also sometimes called National Financial Capability Month, which is still observed today. While growing the coalition at both the state and national levels, she has led the enhancement of legacy programs, including Jumpstart Clearinghouse and national standards in K-12 personal finance education. Laura does not consider herself a financial expert, but rather a staunch advocate for financial education and information, and she hopes she's raising a financially literate son. Welcome, Laura, to the podcast. Thank you, Mary and Rachel. It is uh, really a pleasure to join you. This is a lot of fun. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Laura, we're so excited to have you on the show, especially with April being Financial Literacy Month. But before we dive into your work with Jumpstart, I was hoping we could look back a couple years. Over the last couple months, we've been doing a podcast series on careers in the personal finance space. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your own leadership story and what led you to Jumpstart and the work you're doing today? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I think that uh, my story, like the uh, story of so many nonprofit leaders, is that it wasn't the path that I started out on. And so (laughs) my background is actually in communications. I was a journalist. I did uh, communications at places like FINRA uh, back when it was the NASD. And so... My background comes from uh, being a communicator within the financial services field, and I just sort of wound up there. So I spent a lot of my early career writing about finance and financial topics in a way, you know, to, to make it accessible to consumers. So it wasn't a huge leap when I sort of, you know, veered off into financial education, which has a lot of similarities. It's, it is, you know, more specifically teaching uh, rather than just, you know, writing about it. But it, it's, it's a lot of the same thing is how do we help consumers and especially how do we help students uh, better understand financial topics. And so I was at FINRA when, uh, and which is the parent, of course, of NASDAQ. And I was asked to take over the NASDAQ Educational Foundation temporarily temporarily they said temporarily <laughs> and after a number of months there in this temporary position i asked when they were going to fill the, the the vacancy and they said oh we were hoping you didn't notice that <laughs> you were just you know and they said we haven't posted the job why don't you just stay So I I did. And so that's where I was just before Jumpstart. I was the director of the NASDAQ Educational Foundation and was recruited to come to Jumpstart when my predecessor, Dara Duguay, left. So and, and that was now coming up on 18 years ago. Oh, Laura, I love that story because (laughs) I just realized, in fact, I'm sitting here listening like 18 years, I've known this. And then I realized I met you one year into your presidency. I had just finished my graduate work at Texas Tech and I literally came out to Washington, D.C. with two contacts. It was Jerry Mason and yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh And that's the only people I knew. And I remember sitting down in that conversation, which felt like yesterday, but 
we realize it's almost two decades ago now, but just you were such a breath of light and excitement and Jumpstart had just started. So tell us a little bit more about Jumpstart and the history of Jumpstart and the coalition. It was my pleasure. And I remember that too, Mary. I, 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 I do. <laughs> and and I think it was uh, that Jerry was the one who connected us. He was, yep. Uh, yeah. So yeah, Jumpstart was originally formed in 1995. Informally, that was, was the, w the first gathering of the coalition. And it really started from a group of organizations, many of the ones that are still partners now, that said, look, we, there are a lot of us are trying to do something in this financial education space. Wouldn't it be better if we kind of shared and talked about what each of us is doing to see where there's overlaps, where there's gaps, how can we support each other? And so from there, the nature of the coalition was built. The coalition is credited to Bill Odom, you know, and, mm -hmm. and people who have attended our awards events know that we have the Odom Award as our Visionary Leadership Award because it was his vision to form a coalition to address the financial literacy issue. And the other thing that I think is, is interesting that some people don't know, people know that we have a clearinghouse, but really the clearinghouse was the first product that Jumpstart was built on. Rosella Bannister, who was the director of the National Institute of Consumer Education at Eastern Michigan University, said, we have this database of stuff. Can you use it and can you spread it? And so it, that became both the start of the Jumpstart Clearinghouse and Jumpstart's first real product. And it was 25, almost 26 years ago. What we focus our efforts on is we now say communication, collaboration, and support for effectiveness in financial education. So communication is we are the financial literacy cheerleader. We tell the story. We, we try to wave our arms and get attention. And so we like to think of ourselves as, you know, the mouthpiece for financial literacy on behalf of the many, many partners that we have. Collaboration is that uh, we are built on a spirit of working together. That was that was how we were founded. And so the other role that we, we like to play is to bring the community together and try to foster uh, collaboration, not just between partners and Jumpstart, but between partners and each other and partners and educators. And so we believe in the collaborative approach. And then everything else we do is Jumpstart itself is not an educator. What we try to do is those activities that support education and very specifically support effectiveness in financial education. So the standards, the clearinghouse resources, teacher training, the many things that we think make financial education work. Laura, that's so great. And I, I love what you say about collaboration too, because I think that's something that's been really special for us to be a part of the board is just the relationships that we've built with so many other people in the field. Rather than reinventing the wheel, how do we work together to make programs and processes more effective, whether it's in schools or in the organizations that support schools? Yeah, thank you for saying that. And, and you know, and it's one of the things that, that we just love. And so, you know, as I mentioned, we have had a, a, a very long relationship with AFCPE. And, and you know, I, I, I said I've, I've now been with Jumpstart coming up on 18 years, and AFCPE was already represented on our board then. So I think, uh, you know, you've been with us uh, really just about since the beginning. And we love the opportunity to work with our partners and have our partners work with each other. And we're also really proud of the fact that we have and strive to have organizational diversity. So we have partners from financial services and from nonprofits and associations and from academia and from government. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion these days. And so Jumpstart as a coalition of organizations, we really like to uphold diversity among the types of organizations that uh, participate. Laura, help our listeners understand too, Jumpstart's real focus is the K through 12 education space. Has it expanded beyond that? Our focus is actually, we say preschool through college age. So a little broader than K-12, but still very youth focused. And, and that is really where Jumpstart started and remains our focus and really remains our, our niche in the broader financial literacy field. But we recognize that a lot of our partners that serve audiences beyond 
you know, just students or in fact, some that don't even serve students at all can still use Jumpstart as a way of connecting with other organizations that share similar missions or similar beliefs, certainly similar values in the importance of financial literacy. And so while we do focus on students and, and you'll see in you know our logo, uh, the tagline is financial smarts for students. And so that, that will always remain our focus, but not our exclusive target. So many of our listeners are really passionate about the value of financial literacy education, although many don't work directly in the K through 12 space. But what's unique about our professionals, while they work in financial education, counseling, coaching, planning, many are also parents. And so they are really passionate about financial education, especially starting at a young age. What would you say to someone listening today? How can they get more involved with the coalition? Where should they start? First of all, what, what is important about what you said, Rachel, is, is that many of your members and in, in you know, your field, uh, they are also parents, grandparents, guardians, maybe you know, aunts and uncles and neighbors, but in their personal life, you know, have a responsibility for young people. And so our Project Groundswell and Check Your School campaign is based on getting more financial education in more schools across the country. And the way that we want to do this, our strategy is to have parents and guardians and grandparents and other family members help us make the ask so that everyone isn't responsible for getting it into every school. We want individuals just to focus on their school. So where, whether it's their personal school or their kid's school or, you know, so we want to go big by starting small. And financial professionals like the counselors that you work with um, have sort of that double whammy is that they're invested in their own kids and their own kids' schools, but they also bring that financial expertise and perspective to make them a passionate advocate and to make them a credible advocate. Because, you know, we, we hear all the time from schools that parents are still the loudest voice in effecting change in schools. We don't always feel it, but, but that's what they tell us. If a parent who also is a financial professional makes the case and helps us make the case to bring personal finance education into their own kids' schools, that's really a powerful message. And so one of the things that we, we hope that your listeners will, will consider is you could go to the Check Your School site, and it's, it is just checkyourschool.org, and look up to see what we know about financial education at your own child's school. And there is also a function where you can send an email to the principal at your child's school. That is, we, we offer you a pre-written email or you could just write one yourself. But we're asking people, help us make the ask uh, because together, I think we could make a lot of noise. Laura, this is awesome. I Every time I talk to you, I learn so much more because <laughs> there's just so much happening in this field. And I think that going back to what you said earlier, this collaboration mentality allows it to grow so rapidly in just a few years. And so it's amazing to hear all of the wonderful work that is taking place. Well, thank you. But you know, I, I think that what's important about Jumpstart is we often say that coalition partners, you know, Jumpstart's partners don't belong to the coalition. They are the coalition, you know, because that's what a coalition is. It is a group of, of many organizations or, or entities uh, that are working together. And so I think that you know, while, uh, well, it's very nice to, <laughs> to hear you give credit to Jumpstart. Jumpstart isn't one organization, we're, we're many. And so it is all the field and, and what we're all doing collectively. And I think that's what's moving the needle. I love the direct action that you give listeners to take today. I think that's something everyone listening can do is visit Check Your School and think about what's that small impact you can make in your local community or in your local school. I'm curious, I know Jumpstart also has some state coalitions. Is there any advice for our financial professionals who may want to you know, have a bigger impact? Where would they begin with following up with the state coalition? Jumpstart has a network of independent affiliated state coalitions. So each of our state coalitions is an independent entity, but they're affiliated with us and we provide some support and some commonality. But most of our state coalitions are operated either entirely or predominantly with volunteers. So your members and your listeners who are saying, hey, what can I do? 
I would encourage them to go to the Jumpstart State Coalition. They're not all called Jumpstart, but the Jumpstart affiliate in their own state and start there. And it is an opportunity to not only participate, but also to network with other folks in your area, you know, that share the same ideas that you do. And sometimes it's just encouraging to get to talk to someone who, you know, will nod their head in agreement and say, yes, yes, that's that's the right thing. And so the way to find our state coalitions is on Jumpstart's website. So our website is jumpstart.org. And you go to our state coalition map and you just click on your state. You find it on, you know, the map of the U.S. and, and you click and it'll take you to the website of the local state coalition. And I encourage you to do it through our site because, as I mentioned, most of them are called Jumpstart, the State Jumpstart Coalition. But a few of them aren't. And so if you're not sure how to find it, you know, you can find them through our website and it'll take you directly to the, the state website. We have a couple of places where we don't have an active coalition right now. And so if anyone is interested, definitely call the national office and we will either find you someplace or, you know, the other thing about being a coalition is we very much would like for you to be involved with us, but we would love for you to be involved with other coalition partners. And so on our website, there's some of our partners that look for volunteers. We try to post that there so that if a financial professional says, hey, I want to give back, but I'm looking for other things to do, there are some other Jumpstart partners that want other volunteers. So there's a lot of ways to get involved and use your expertise to improve financial literacy and especially for kids. That's awesome. I love how many opportunities there are to get involved at varying levels with Jumpstart and with the work you're doing. In fact, that's the next segment that I want to go into is you have a lot of resources. You mentioned the Educators Clearinghouse at the beginning, and I'd like to delve more into that. How can our financial coaches and counselors use this Educators Clearinghouse in their work? Oh, that's a, a wonderful question. So the, the Clearinghouse is, you know, the, the website is just jumpstartclearinghouse.org. Uh, you can also get to it from our uh, main website. And you can search the Clearinghouse for various resources, uh, search by type, search by audience. And so most of it is school-based or student-focused where it is um, elementary school, middle school, high school, post-secondary. But we have resources for adults. You know, and so you can go to the Clearinghouse. You can search by audience segment. You can search by topic. So if you're just looking for a lesson on credit or on budgeting, you could, you could search that way. Maybe you're looking for a full curriculum or maybe you're just looking for a video or a game. So there's a lot of ways to search the many resources that are available. And I think that I would also add that if any of your audience are resource providers, either as individuals or, or through their organization, if you have resources that you would like to make available, you can submit your resources for listing in the Clearinghouse, and you'll see that link on the Clearinghouse site as well. Uh, just a little online form where you tell us about the resource and give us a sample, and uh, we'll take it from there. Laura, as you've mentioned, AFCPE has been a strong board member for decades. You know, we've been very active in Jumpstart's board, and we've gained a lot of value in participating in the board. Can you help our listeners understand what AFCPE has provided to the board? And maybe even beyond that, how, you know, what kind of organizations you're looking for to, to get involved with that board? So in general, you know, we look for partner organizations. Uh, the Jumpstart board actually elects organizations rather than individuals to our board. So it is AFCPE as an organization that holds a seat on our board and then designates a representative to come and, and be the person who serves on the board. And so what we look for, as I mentioned, you know, organizational diversity. So as we're addressing Jumpstart's issues and financial literacy issues, we like having a variety of a representation 
on our board. So, so it's, you know, the nonprofits, it's the for profits. And then also within finance, we like having people from credit, people from banking, people from investing insurance. And so we look to have that diverse representation on our board. And AFCPE has been a wonderful partner and and board member. My specific example is, you know, we talked a little bit about teacher training. You know, we have an annual National Educators Conference. And one of the things that we did for a few years was we did mini counseling sessions. And so AFCPE provided volunteers from your membership that came as a pre-conference and a post-conference activity where your volunteers sat with teachers and did little mini counseling sessions with them as individual consumers. So aside from being a teacher, you know, our, our teachers, uh, you know, they're, they're consumers and, and sometimes they brought their spouse or domestic partner for that segment, you know, they uh, and, and sat there and, and had counseling. And so these are some of the ways that partners and, and specifically one of the ways that AFCPE helps support what our teachers do. So that is at the national level. If someone is in a state and wants to become a partner or get involved, you mentioned how to get involved as an individual. How do they get involved as a corporation or an organization at the state level? So interestingly, that's a really <laughs> good question, is that our state coalitions are independent organizations. And so they are affiliated with us. It's, it's more like a franchise model. You know how a lot of franchise stores are independently owned and operated, but mm -hmm. they share branding and, and, you know, kind of, uh, they're all rowing in the same direction. Well, that's sort of what we do with our states. And I mentioned that by way of saying that each of our state coalitions has its own board and bylaws. And so the answer to that, fortunately and unfortunately, it's, it just makes it not as easy, is that it, it may differ from one to the next. So usually what we encourage people to do is start on that coalition's website so that the individual or organization can find out what the circumstance is in, you know, in their state and start with the leadership there. It's almost like your state government versus the national government. Start local and then as you're getting involved locally, it will also raise opportunities at a national level too. Laura, tell us a little bit more about financial educations in schools right now, or dare I say, the lack thereof. I'm curious about the trends and what you're seeing. Actually, the Council for Economic Education is the one that tracks progress in terms of, you know, through their survey of the states, how many states are requiring financial education now. But the thing about that is that it maybe doesn't tell the whole story in that it, it, it tracks where it's required, but not necessarily where it's taught. And so, and it's very hard to pick up all the places where it's just being taught and integrated uh, voluntarily. But even as the survey is showing progress in growth in the number of states that make this a requirement, we're also looking to integrate financial education at all grade levels. Um, certainly at the elementary school level, it would be very basic, but this is when kids are forming their habits and their beliefs, so why not introduce money as a topic and, and introduce, you know, some sound habits at that time in their life when they're developing so that by the time they get to middle school and high school and they can take a real course in finance, they already have a head start. So that's one of the reasons why we've made our Check Your School campaign a top priority is because we really believe in financial education in schools and at all grade levels. Recently, you know, this has been what Jumpstart believes is our contribution to the financial inclusion effort. Because if you think about less advantaged communities, students that are in less advantaged communities, generally speaking, have less opportunity to learn about personal finance at home. Perhaps, you know, their own parents or family environment, they might be unbanked or underbanked. So they might have less experience in, in financial services. Some kids don't have a family. You know, so there are a lot of reasons why at Jumpstart we believe it's important to start the financial discussion at home, but we can't rely on that. So schools, you know, K through 12 in all neighborhoods and, you know, all shapes and sizes, this is our opportunity to get some of this learning and some of this information to students who might not be getting it anyplace else and hopefully have a positive impact on, you know, their start as adult consumers someday. So we think it's really important and it's why we've put a lot of effort into, you know, 
professional development for teachers, into resources for teachers, into, you know, our, our national teacher conference, you know, all of these things is, is to support good financial learning at all grade levels to give all kids, but especially those who maybe need it the most, that head start on their lives. Laura, this is a great discussion. And I'm even thinking, as you mentioned earlier, this can be parents. So parents that are involved can come to the clearinghouse and be able to download and teach games. I'm actually homeschooling my kindergarten child right now. And just yesterday we had, uh, we were learning about pennies, nickels, and dimes. And she came to check out her hot cocoa, and I put that in quotes, and she didn't have enough. And I just, and so I said, well, you gotta put that one back. And this one's a little less expensive. And I thought at the moment I was teaching it, it was a very simple lesson, right? But in that moment I was teaching it, it really hit me at five years old, what an impact learning that you can't just walk into a store and get anything you want that it costs money. And I, I think that those small and simple lessons will reverberate throughout their lives. So I agree, you can't start too early that this is, as you mentioned earlier, even pre-K and kindergarten can yeah. still learn at this. That's absolutely right, Mary. It is at the time the kids start to show interest in money or, or not even necessarily in money, but show interest in spending. You uh -huh. know? And so mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I did that with my own son when he was little and we used to stop on the way home from school to get a snack at CVS and I would give him a dollar. What he started to learn was the individual size bags of potato chips he could afford <laughs> yeah. that, but he couldn't afford the family size bag. The big one. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very simple, but they start to catch on to money as a limited commodity. And so, you know, so, so it is like, okay, this is, I know I get my dollar every day, but I know that I can't buy anything. I have my choice, but my choice is within the limit of what I can afford. It seems very, very basic, but we have to remember that our kids are growing up in a very electronic society. They don't see money the way we did growing up, you know, cash money. And so I think uh, parents sometimes need to be very deliberate about how we introduce some of these exercises. And so even if our kids don't actually spend cash, like my son thinks of cash as his savings strategy because <laughs> they don't. They, they, they spend everything electronically. So he actually takes cash and, and sort of tucks it away. And he says, that's like my savings because you can't spend it online. You can't spend, you know, there's, yeah. it, it, so it's his safety. Isn't that interesting that it, it has turned around? Well, and I'm even thinking on your Jumpstart Clearinghouse, there are so many resources. In fact, I'm going to encourage all our listeners to go to the Clearinghouse, no matter whether you're teaching elementary all the way up to college. One of my favorite, and, and I think one of the most popular features on here is the stock market game. Yeah. So if you're saying, well, I missed that opportunity when they were five, guess what? There's plenty more opportunities in junior high, in high school, and even beyond. And there's so many resources on here for no matter what age your child is, or if you are an aunt or a loved one or a teacher, this is just the place to go to get what you need to enhance your curriculum. Thank you. And also that, you know, these aren't Jumpstart's resources. These are our partners' resources. And so this is where the strength of the coalition, I think, is, is depicted very well. Laura, this has been a delightful interview. And at the end of each interview, we like to get the guests two cents or biggest takeaways for our listeners. If you had one piece of advice to offer our financial professionals, what would it be? I am not a financial expert myself or, or, you know, I certainly, that, that isn't where my expertise uh, lies. So I'm not sure that I would have uh, advice for your membership, but as a parent, one of the things is that I, I think we have to remember that when we're teaching finance to young kids, we have to remember that you don't learn everything in one shot. And so the analogy that I sometimes use is when you were teaching your kid how to ride a two-wheel bike, if they fell off the bike, you didn't give up. You didn't, you know, throw away the bike and say, well, this doesn't work, <laughs> right? You, you dust them off and you put them back on and you say, try again. Well, personal finance is like that. So for all the parents that maybe are starting their kids on allowance or are starting some sort of an exercise that might help them save or learn to spend wisely or anything, if they make mistakes in the beginning, 
it's not a failure. And so uh, my what I hope is that your listeners, uh, you know, in their parent-grandparent role will remember that they have a lot of expertise to pass along to the kids in their lives. But as experts, they're going to have to allow whoever they're teaching. And that's whether it's a kid or, or maybe it's a client, you know, but that, that we have to allow for mistakes because not everyone gets on a bike and rides away the first time that they're on. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Can you tell our listeners where they can connect with you? Thank you so very much for having me. And this has been a ton of fun. And so you can find Jumpstart at jumpstart.org. That's our main website. And my contact information and all of my colleagues are right there on that site. Our social media, both for Facebook and Twitter, is at National Jumpstart, which is at N-A-T-L-J-U-M-P-S-T-A-R-T. And my Twitter handle is just L. Levine. Laura, this is fantastic. Thanks for being on today. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a pleasure. Great to speak to you both and have a, a happy Financial Literacy Month. Rachel, it is really fun to talk to Laura again. She was really an influence in my life very early, early on in my career and has been throughout. It's wonderful to connect back with her and just see the growth. The thing I like about Laura is we're able to channel this passion that we have for teaching financial literacy and teaching financial education and work together, as she mentioned so many times, as a coalition, that it's not just you on your own. I remember coming out here to DC and thinking, I'm going to change the world through financial education. Well, little did I know, once I talked to Laura Levine, I realized there's a whole community out there that is teaching financial education and trying to change the world through that. So if you are listening to this podcast now and have a desire to get involved, this is the place to really get started. And it has been such a highlight and enjoyment to be able to talk to her. A couple of things that I really enjoyed taking a career framework from it is she started as a journalist. She was a marketer and a communications expert. And the thing I love about that is that it's really important that you know how to communicate these messages, that you know how to encourage people and write about it and talk about it in order to get people behind it and move the needle forward, I guess, in lots of ways. So I would say anyone listening to this podcast, you don't have to be a financial expert to be a part of this field, that you can come in from psychology or marketing or communications or any place and actually be quite successful in bringing us together and working through some of our needs as a field. The other thing that I really liked learning about was the clearinghouse. And I know I mentioned it before, but I will emphasize again, just on our call, I was astounded with how much there is. So whether you're a homeschool parent, whether your kids are in public school, private school, secondary school, it does not matter. There is so many resources. You can encourage the teachers to do it. The other thing I would say too, even if you're a parent volunteer at a local school, you can use this information to go in and help. What we've seen a lot in the past is sometimes teachers are reluctant to teach personal finance because they don't feel that they know enough about it to be able to teach the students. So if you're thinking, hey, I'd really like to get involved with my child's school or something, then maybe you're the one that goes in and teaches it. How can you become more involved at your local level, whether it's your community or even your state? That was the final thought for me is I realized I have not reached out to my state yet. And so I, it was a good reminder to me that I need to jump on my uh, Virginia State Board as well and offer to be of help and resource to them. And so I would encourage anyone listening today that if you had any interest to reach out and get involved and see where those connections can lead you and others along the way. Mary, I totally agree. One of the things that really resonated with this conversation early on was her path into this field. And I, I think you're right. I mean, I came into this career path from a background in communications and marketing as well. And so I really relate to that. And I think a lot of our listeners relate to that. So many people that work in the personal finance space did not start there. We have a lot of career changers that come into this field. A lot of people don't find their passion for personal finance, you know, at 20, 22 years old. Sometimes it's something that happened within their lives that 
made them realize their why and led them to this career path. The other thing that she talked about was collaboration and Jumpstart is really at its heart of their collaborators. I actually, Mary, met you for the first time at a Jumpstart Awards dinner. I don't know if you even remember it. but I it do was... remember that. I can't believe it's been that long. So yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the people that we've met within the field have, have been part of that Jumpstart community. And so they hold us a really important place with our community. With it being Financial Literacy Month, it is April. I think so many of the things that she talked about today are, you know, whether or not you work in K through 12 education. Most of our listeners probably don't. A lot of them have children that are in school or work with clients that have families that these are affecting or work with clients that have money scripts and things that they developed in childhood. And so the importance of financial literacy and education in schools is critical. And so, you know, if you do one thing today, I I say go to check your school sign up, really push the importance of financial education in your community. Mary, I loved what you said about, you know, as financial professionals, what can we do in our community for our candidates that are going through the AFC program? What a great way, you know, to gain some experience, go into the community um, and offer that financial education. As we move into the end of April, I just also wanted to remind everyone that we are having an AFCPE Connections Fair. It will be held on April 28th, and that whole week will provide different webinars and education opportunities for our members. But on April 28th, we have a number of employers who are offering jobs and also experience hours. So if you're looking for an internship or just a way to expand your horizon, you know, check out our website. I'll put that in the show notes, but we hope you attend the AFCPE Connections Fair. If you enjoyed the show today, please share it with a friend. This helps others discover the podcast and become a part of our community. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.